Have you ever heard a musical artist described as having great chops? What does that mean? Well, the term chops is slang in the music business that refers to an artist that has developed great skills over time, whether they are a musician, composer, producer, or other titles associated with the music business. This is Scott Grimaldi, your host of Got Chops. Join me as I interview one musical artist per episode that I've had the pleasure of either performing, recording, or work with in my career. Plus, I'll be interviewing artists I've always wanted to speak with. We'll discover how each artist developed their chops, listen to their stories, and much more. This is Got Chops. My special guest artist for today is Greg Patillo, an American flutist recognized worldwide for his signature beatbox flute sound. That's Greg playing beatbox flute behind me on his rendition of Inspector Gadget from his landmark YouTube video that went viral in 2007. His solo videos have reached over 100 million views featuring his arrangements that span the gamut of musical styles from Nintendo's Super Mario Brothers to Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf. Greg has been featured on TV shows that include Jay Leno and iCarly, and his music was also featured in the 2017 Lego Ninjago movie as the beatbox flute music of Master Wu. As a published author of his beatbox flute method books, Mr. Patillo has taught master classes on beatbox flute and improvisation at numerous higher education institutions that include the Juilliard School, Curtis Institute of Music, and Berklee College of Music. In addition to his solo career, Greg is a founding member of the touring musical ensemble, the Project Trio, that has over 100,000 subscribers on their YouTube channel. This multi-talented beatbox flutist and educator certainly got chops. Please welcome Greg Patillo. Hi, Greg. This is Scott from Got Chops. How are you? Great, man. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for asking. So on the phone right now for my listeners calling from New York is today's guest, Greg Patillo. Greg is a flutist known worldwide for his signature beatbox flute sound. He's also a soloist, composer, author of two method books on beatbox flute, teaches master classes, and a founding member of the group Project Trio. Greg, thanks once again for granting me this time. I'm looking so forward to our conversation. All right, me too, man. Right on. So let me ask you, as a flutist, what does the music slang got chops mean to you? Uh, well, maybe there's a two-part answer because got chops is different than just having chops. Like uh, having chops is just like professional level, you know, 
uh, everything is like an extension of your will. You're like past the limitations of your instrument. You can like play. Um, but like when you got chops, that's what you say when someone blows you away, when you watch someone play and you're like, oh man, they got chops. And what do they got chops in? Is it, oh, they got beatbox chops or breathing chops uh, on the flute, of course. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to play the flute. So I don't know what are the most awesome chops of flute playing. Uh, but I'm really into uh, like beatbox sounds, kind of rhythmic flute stuff, a lot of breathing, extended techniques of articulation. So uh, I guess that's my spin on Got Chops. So I read that you were raised in Seattle, Washington, and you currently live in Brooklyn, New York. That's right. So how long did you live in Seattle before moving to New York? Um, I was born and raised in Seattle until I went to college in Cleveland. I started playing the flute in the fourth grade. I don't come from a musical family. And I got into a conservatory in Cleveland, the Cleveland Institute of Music. I got it. I went to do classical music. I was going to be an orchestral flute player. And uh, I was in Cleveland for eight years. I briefly played an orchestra in China, moved back to Cleveland. And then I sold everything I owned and moved to the coolest place I could think of, San Francisco, where no one wanted to listen to my flute music, my classical flute music. And I was trying to impress these like street artists out in San Francisco that uh, we should be jamming together. Uh, and they were like, all right, well, what are you going to do on the flute? And I was like, I don't know. I'm going to do something really cool. And they were doing like the spoken word type stuff. And so I was like, I'll do rhythm, beatbox, flute, and try to fit it in with these words. So it was like a collaborative birth my beatboxing with these guys. And the first night I was there, incidentally, I met the lady that would become my wife and the mother of my children. And uh, she was like, I don't want to be a street poet anymore. I want to go to law school. And I was like, oh, okay. And she got into law school in New York. So about 18 years ago, we drove across the country in her pickup truck and we've been in New York ever since. Let's go back when you, you mentioned you began playing flute in the fourth grade and you were a member of the uh, school band. What made you select the flute as your instrument of choice? I have no idea. I, I really don't, man. Back then, like there wasn't the internet. Like we had like, they had a brochure of all the instruments printed on it. And you know how it is. Me and my mom picked the flute. Like that's what she ended up renting me at the store. So I don't know what went down that day. I didn't know anything about the flute. I just thought it looked cool. Started playing it. Uh, started in my band, and then I remember being real disappointed we weren't learning fast enough. Like, I had this instrument that could do all this stuff, and we were learning, like, one note a week. And my mom got me – she got me private lessons, uh, and the lesson she ended up getting me was something called Suzuki flute. Uh, and the Suzuki method is, like, a really interesting method where you teach the students all by ear how to play. Like, you get the book, but you're supposed to listen to the tape, and the lessons are done, like, listen to me, play it back. And so – uh, as soon as I started playing the instrument, I actually was doing all this really heavy ear training, which is something that I use now all the time. It's like the basis of my musicianship, you know, what I'm doing with my ear. So that, you know, by the time I was in like middle school, you know, and at the slow dance with your girlfriend, I could like hear the song on the radio and figure it out on the piano or my flute and play it for her, you know, stuff like that. You know, you could just like amuse your friends and like just by hearing music and playing it back because that's how I like took in a lot of music was by ear. So let me ask you, growing up, who were some of your favorite flute artists that maybe influenced or inspired you? Um, I honestly, like, this is hard for people today to understand, but like back in the day, it was really hard to listen to music unless you bought the album, heard it on the radio, or someone else had the album, or like you went to a show. And uh, I don't know, we didn't have too much music around the house. I didn't listen to any flute players. Um, I went to shows, I guess, but not really flute players, more like orchestra things and kind of rock stuff as I was getting older. And about when I became a teenager, I was starting to actually second guess this whole classical flute thing. I wasn't sure if it was for like a dude like me. And I asked my mom if she knew of any like cool flute music. And she hit me to a band called Jethro Tull. And uh, got a Jethro Tull album or five and uh, totally was down with those dudes. And they swung through Seattle on their 25th anniversary tour. And I got to see him in the early 90s. Uh, and Ian Anderson fronts that band. It's a rock band, a very storied, awesome rock band from back in the day. Fronted by a flute player. And he does, he just sings, plays guitar, plays harmonica. And he used to like dance and throw the flute up in the air and all this stuff. And I saw him. 
I, and it like changed my mind and changed like my concept of how I wanted to play the flute. So seeing Jethro Tull and Ian Anderson in person really opened my eyes. I was like a young teenager, man. I was so impressionable too. It was a pretty good show. I was going to mention Jethro Tull because I kind of thought you, you know, of course, as a flautist, you, especially with the advanced flute techniques that you and I were both taught, uh, long before I was a flute major, uh, at Berklee College of Music in Boston, when I was a teenager, you know, they came on the scene. If you're a boy, young boy, and you're playing the flute, uh, you get ridiculed all the time. Did you have the same experience? Uh, yes. I mean, literally, I'm, I'm tracking with you here. Uh, all of that applied to me growing up. I used to get made fun of for playing the flute. And really, the only thing that was like uh, helping me out was I happened to be excelling at flute you know, and uh, doing a lot of cool flute things. So it was worthy of taking like the beat downs socially, you know, but like finding cool flute music was so refreshing. People that, you know, that were older, that looked up to this like rock music and they thought it was impressive. And so I've been playing the Jethro Tull Beret since I've been in high school, you know, and I still play it regularly on the program. Do you? Uh, yeah, yeah. I play it uh, every time we perform pretty much. Uh, I, I play it like note for note, pretty much. I do a little bit of improv in it. But uh, as a totally a call out to, to that dude, he was really influential to me. And now that we have the internet, like, you know, he learned a lot from like Rasan Wolin Kirk. Yeah. And there's all these other really great, like, especially in the jazz world, all these like sax players that played the flute. And, and they ended up taking the flute in a totally different direction because they're not playing the flute like a classical flute player. And so they're able to get all these interesting concepts and sounds out that is that you don't see represented like in the like Western literature, say, you know, different uh, sonorities of the flute or ways to attack or ways to breathe. Like I learned so much from Ian Anderson and he's famous for never having a lesson. You know, he's also a guitar player and so much of what he does with his mouth and articulation, I think, is exactly like how you play the guitar and how you use a pick, how you use hammer-ons and picking. Uh, and so like, you know, vibing off these other cats, playing different instruments, um, putting those concepts onto the flute has been a profound influence to me as I've gotten older and searched out recordings and where all this came from. So let's touch upon your, um, your experience in college. You went to a music conservatory, the uh, Cleveland Institute of Music. You hold a bachelor degree in uh, flute performance plus a master's degree in flute performance. You were influenced by Jethro Tull. You want to become a classical player. When you were there, were you also um, showing your friends in the flute section the different uh, techniques that Jethro Tull was doing? Were they accepting of that or not? Did they think, what's this guy doing? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I kind of uh, accidentally ended up uh, where I ended up for college. Uh, I, growing up in Seattle, very liberal society. It was during the grunge rock epidemic. Uh, there was a lot of hip hop in the air. Uh, and I just thought like at music school, people would be like jamming on their instruments and being really into it. But I managed to go to an extremely conservative uh, classical conservatory where it was like only classical music and i had long hair like a long ponytail i'd just gotten into the grateful dead i saw him like the summer that jerry garcia passed away like it was 95 and like i was like my eyes are open to all this like cool music you know and like none of that was studied at the conservatory so for the first two years i was pretty much an outcast i like started a band and like you know was doing a bunch of other things and I remember my teacher gave me an A minus, like, you know, my soft, my sophomore year, last semester, I was like, an A minus? Why would you give me an A minus? And he says, well, I don't think you're really into this. And I'm like, well, I don't think I am into this, as a matter of fact. Like, what's the big deal? And he's like, well, I want you to think about this this summer, you know, you got two more years left. And I did. And we like came back and the band got together and like we had a rehearsal and like half the people didn't show up. And I was like, I had it in my head to be like, nope, this isn't it. I'm going to school. I'm spending the money. Let's do this. And so I like <laughs> another drastic thing. I just sold all my CDs pretty much and just like gave myself a curfew and like woke up every day at seven in the morning and practiced and like hit four hours in the practice room every day and kind of totally changed my life around and really focused on classical music like so much. And I 
today, virtually all I listen to passionately is classical music. I love classical music so much. And uh, I learned all about it in school. And so I went to grad school at the same school. I was kind of like, hey, man, give me another two years since I fluffed my first two years. And my professor was down. And, uh, you know, the Cle he played Joshua Smith was my teacher. He played in Cleveland Orchestra uh, right down the, the, the way. And we used to get free tickets. If you woke up early on, on Monday morning, they'd give you free tickets for Saturday night. And I went and saw the most amazing top tier classical acts for years uh, in Cleveland. And, uh, and uh, so that was really cool, man. I learned a lot. You can learn so much from a classical education and then laterally apply it anywhere you know a lot of people end up not being musicians but then go on to do business or finance or lawyers and it's because the skills you learn to tackle the classical repertoire can be used in any facet of life uh, and uh, i use them now even still to skill build and uh, to enjoy classical music i love it <laughs> that's great so in the performances that you witnessed did you ever see ron paul or galway and if you did what do you think about them these guys have a very interesting sound. It's a very different sound than the American flute sound. Yes. Uh, if you study like Tafanel Gobert, and they had a student, Moise, and they are like a Moise school, and we're more like a Tafanel school in America, kind of through the Kincaid school out of Boston and whatnot. You can hear this in an American sound versus uh, Euro sound, I guess. And like Galway really brings that, you know, that very like laser focused sound. You don't hear that very much like in American orchestras uh, it's such a great solo sound so i really appreciate those guys tone what they're doing for solo playing uh, but uh honestly there's so many great different ways to play the flute i, I wish i'd uh, met ron paul I, I got to hang with galway and i jammed with him at one point no kidding cool. wow you know and i was like aware of him so you know you're asking like who i listened to i knew who galway was as a kid um, because you know why he was on Sesame Street. Yes. You know, rapping with Oscar the Grouch. You know, he was this bearded dude with a gold flute. And I watched Sesame Street. And so I knew who he was, you know, back then. That was like the social media of its day, you know, Sesame Street. So on the jazz side, I'm sure you you know of these players and have listened to them. People like Kirby Mann, uh Joe Farrell. I mean, I think they're just they have their own individual sound. Uh, uh, big time. Um, yeah, I got a bunch of those guys' records, man. I'm, I'm into that jazz sound. Um, ultimately, though, um, you know, I come from a classical frame of mind and a just playing by ear frame of mind. And so I've learned a bunch of jazz tricks over the years. But I don't sit in on jazz sessions because I kind of fake jazz a little bit. You know, I'm kind of a little shoddy on my changes. Like I get all the changes. I just don't have like hundreds of songs memorized. You know what I'm saying? I'm like a fake jazz guy, but I get jazzy. If, if that makes any sense to you. So uh, I'm down with all these great jazz sounds and stuff. but. Uh, 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 you know, not, I'm I'm not always very inspired by jazz flute techniques. I'm more inspired by like what the violin and the guitar are doing and drum sets. Honestly, it's like what do other instruments do, you know? And how can you do that on the flute? So, when or where did you get the idea or inspiration to apply beatboxing on the flute? Uh, well, believe it or not, it comes through trying to mess with bluegrass styles. Wow. Um. Uh. There's a, well, Jerry Garcia used to play banjo at a band called Old and in the Way. It was a whole bluegrass bit he did. And Jerry Garcia was the guitarist and singer of the Grateful Dead. And he had a little bluegrass vibe. And uh, I got through the Grateful Dead, got into these albums. And there was all this great mandolin, violin, bluegrass playing. And I was around a bunch of great string players in Cleveland. And there was kind of a little local bar called the Barking Spider. They had live music every night right on campus. And there'd be, you know, it was kind of like, on the i don't know the the circuit around the appalachians or whatever you know like people would stop through cleveland at this bar and i heard all this great like violin chopping you know the backbeat chop and so my first sound on flute was just ripping pentatonics and getting a backbeat chop going at the same time vamps and chop and just like a really like jethro toll does a lot of like ka, ha, ka, ha, ka, ka, ha, ka, where you shuffle your breath you do a lot of like uh, inhale exhale stuff that's untongued and then if you cycle it in with 
like you get in a backbeat K and all this kind of stuff. And that's what I was doing when I hit San Francisco and I was trying to be like, okay, well, how am I going to try to do beats with these poets? And all I needed to learn was do the beatbox, the bass drum kick, which is a lip articulation is what it sounds like. And so if you have like that's beatboxing, like that's beats, you know, or you can kind of work with that. And um, all of those end up being articulations just on the flute. You can do it with flute tone or without flute tone. That's great. So that's really where that, where that kind of built out of. And then now since the rise of YouTube and the internet, beatboxing has totally blown up and is a completely different discipline than when I was a kid, or even when I was first making my videos. Um, beatboxing has gone over the edge, man. There are so many crazy sounds now that people do that I, it took me years to figure out how to do it. How long did it take you to master this very specialized technique? Well, if you just learn a handful of sounds, you can do it that day. Like, uh, you know, you can have fun and be entertaining as a beatboxing crew player from day one. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of challenges and a lot of skills. There's a lot of chops to get. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but, uh, um, you know, it's nonstop. The beatbox sounds that people work on now, um, they take forever to learn. And some of them you can't do with flute. And I don't know any other flute players that are doing these sounds. Um, but, you know, there's like buzzing or like there's just like there's so many weird sounds that people are using. And it's like, how do you blow it into flute? And it, they all have a very particular uh, airflow. Uh, funny enough, there's so many ways to play the flute, you know, uh, probably you for, you understand like diaphragmatic uh, playing of the flute, chest voice flute playing, head voice flute playing. And people talk about this all the time in flute lessons, like uh, uh, they talk about the throat, either shape the throat, open the throat, you know, vocalize with the throat or whatever you're going to, you know, shape. But like uh, um, you can get away with playing the flute with a really terrible posture and not being aware of your anatomy, but you can't do beatbox sounds unless you are aware of these places. So my journey lately, just over the past six years even, of really hunkering down and learning the modern techniques has opened up my flute sound incredibly because I'm now like really at like know exactly where how all of my anatomy in my throat and my mouth uh, work towards my flute sound because you have to figure it out for the beatboxing sounds, <laughs> which is pretty cool, man. That's a pretty cool bonus. I got to say. So uh, hopefully aspirational to all flute players listening, man. learn a little bit of beatbox and you will, I guarantee it. You will learn a lot about your flute playing. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. So speaking of flutes, I know that you play Sankyo flutes. Have you also compared beatboxing on other high end brands of flutes like the Haynes and Powell? Yeah, uh, it doesn't really matter, but check this out. So I used to work for these other guys for a long time, uh, and they were famous for making student flutes. And one thing I noticed is that a student-style closed-hold seafoot flute is the best to beatbox on. Really? Yeah, totally. Well, the in order to be able to really beatbox and play the flute at the same time, you got to do a very like head voice style of flute tone. You're not really doing a deep chest voice classical sound. Uh, and I talk about this all the time on my lessons or the videos I put up or whatever, um, like going back and forth between it. That's actually why I think a lot of classical people can't play jazz because they don't have the way to like turn the articulation the other way, you know? And a lot of people that don't know how to open up deep can't get that classical sound because they don't know how to open it up that way. You, you know what I'm saying? Yes, absolutely. You, you play with a small tone on an inexpensive flute and the, flo the, the tone doesn't crack. Like you don't need this great pure airstream to get this beautiful sound. You play with a quiet sound uh, and the way that the air goes through the tube with the closed keys, I feel like it muffles it really nice. Uh, and it allows all the plosives. Uh, it like usually these student flutes take the plosives really well. So um, I play Sankyo flutes. I've been working with Sankyo for the past year now and uh yuka is their um the person that travels all around the world i've seen her all around and i was like yo yuka what's up yo do you guys have anything like 
back in the vault, like a high end C foot closed hold flute, because you can't get a high end C foot closed hold flute in the States because it's normally like a student thing and they upsell you on the B foot and the open holes. Okay. And she was like, let me go check. And she did. She found something. It was like a 15 year old flute, totally handmade. Uh, it was like a one off that they did. They were showing off new key cups or whatever. And I totally scored it off them. And I love it. It's like a little rocket, man. It is so fast, so nice on my forearms. Uh, and I can really do. Uh, I think it really helps with uh, me like shredding changes and doing complicated beatbox things. Like, you know, these sax players, man, they don't got holes in their keys. They're like going through all these changes and they got like big old keys going down. Like, I want that on the flute too. Why do I need to have open holes with like the nice hand posture? Sometimes it's nice to relax that posture and let it rip. So with that in mind, I'm just thinking uh, piccolo. There's no open holes. Um, Alto flute, bass flute, contrabass flute. Have you also tried the beatbox on these smaller and larger flutes? Yeah, but you know, in the end, I, I don't like to carry them with me on the road. Uh, I don't, I don't like the even like uh, you know. I've been like, oh, I could get into electronics, but I don't want to do sound check. You know, like I don't want to, I don't want to do all that. So uh, I have piccolos and alto flutes and bass flutes, and they're cool and they're fun. Sometimes I play them. I, I got to play with the Air Force Band last month, and I got to stand up with the flutes. And we rocked some uh, Stars and Stripes Forever. It was pretty good. I had to look, I had to check that part though. It's been a second since I played that. Uh, but uh, you know, the family of flutes are cool. I've written I've written flute choir music, um, but uh, you know, uh, I, I don't really take those on onto the show. Oh, I got it. You, you got a show down pat, so why change it? <laughs> yeah. So share with my listeners your landmark YouTube videos that began in uh, 2007 with over 100 million views. That's amazing. And talk about the songs and the arrangements you're featured on that span the gamut of musical genres from, let's say, Super Mario Brothers to Freedom Jazz Dance. Okay, yeah. So check this out. I've been trying to be a professional musician my entire life and uh, nothing was working out, man. And I like tried to do classical and then I switched and did like beatbox or whatever. And then I moved to New York, as I've already mentioned, uh, and I couldn't get any work whatsoever. And I ended up working for Trader Joe's in New York City and I worked on the night crew you know, till one in the morning and you take your lunch break at like eight at night. And, uh, well, if you have an eight hour shift with a 45 minute, you know, commute and an hour lunch, like when are you going to blow your taffano go bear and your scales and your long tones, you know, like you're busy, you got a square job. So like, how are you going to stay musical? And this is like a big problem for a lot of people that graduated out of school. And then it's like real life knocks you on the head and you're like, now when am I going to practice? So what I would do is I would play during my lunch break, you know, I'm in New York city. So I could just go right down to the subways and play. And I, I still play, I, I still play regularly in the subways. I went this morning and played for two hours. And um, at night, I was playing for people that got out of happy hour. So I was trying to play up cool, funky music. I was doing my beatbox, and I had a 45-minute set. This is back in 2006 before uh, iPhones were invented. It was hard to do video back then. You needed a video camera or someone to have one. And I'd met a NYU film student who needed music for her films. And I traded her, I gave her some music and uh, she gave me 45 minutes of studio time. And I showed up that day and I literally played down my subway set. And I put those videos up on YouTube where they did nothing for about four months. And then all of a sudden, uh they were featured uh, a couple of them were featured on the front page of youtube and back then youtube was just like a single scroll of videos there were like 10 on the page and so if you got featured on that page you got millions of views uh, and that's what happened to me i was like at work at trader joe's holding the end of the line sign you know it was right in union square which is like you know the store's so busy you have to denote where the end of the line is with this sign so people could get in line and they're like hey man i just saw you on youtube i was like what you know they're like yeah hey, oh yeah you play the flute i'm like what and you know well we didn't have internet on our phones back then i you know called my wife on the cell phone. i was like hey hey you, will you check youtube and see what's up and sure enough bang i got featured and uh within the month i wasn't working at trader joe's anymore i was playing at a nightclub in new york uh every night of the week and then within a year of that had my trio together and we were traveling internationally doing stuff wow so i kind of like had overnight success and that was like uh you know 
This was four months before I turned 30. <laughs> so like to talk about like keeping the dream, man, like I've been like thinking about music my whole life, trying to be professional. These videos kind of hit. I'm so happy that I'm you're talking to me. I hope people listen to this. I hope I can inspire them to musical ends because I'm pleased that uh, I get this forum now. I get to go out and people actually finally care about what I got to say on the instrument. So I'm in here trying to, you know, entertain people, but also I'm trying to try to galvanize the youth, play these instruments, especially in the land of iPads these days. You know, instruments are cool. You know, they're inanimate objects. They can only be as cool as you are. So let's be cool on these instruments. Let's jam out. You know, let's, let's figure it out together. Well, everything you said is really fascinating and uh, right place at the right time. And you kept pursuing your, your dream. And you just never know when it's going to happen. So I know that you've been featured on various TV shows that include Jay Leno and iCarly. And your music has been featured in the 2017 Lego Ninjago movie as the beatbox flute music of Master Wu. Please share with my listeners the exposure you receive from those experiences and the other doors that have opened for you as a result of your specialized way of playing the flute. Um, man, it is awesome being on TV for other people because people watch TV. And if you tell people you were on TV, they think that is the coolest thing. If you've ever done TV, it is a really weird gig for a musician. You know, we just do rehearsals and then play. But, man, they block it and rehearse it and make up it. <laughs> man, it is a whole day be doing TV. But I'm thrilled, like I say, to be out there doing these things. Uh, being on Ninjago is cool. It's these days, it's just cool because I tell kids at the assembly I did it and then maybe they'll listen now to me playing some Bach at them. <laughs> you know, it's like just a little bit of street cred, you know. Uh, and so um, it's cool. It's cool to have done those projects and uh, and I'm trying to do more if someone wants to be in touch with me. But, um, you know, there's music all, all over the place. It's, it's crazy what people think of as music now. I have young kids. Um, I have a middle schooler and a second grader and, um, you know, they consume music a little different than I did when I was a kid. Uh, and, uh, for, for those of you out there, I don't know, getting on TV is a great aspiration, but also just getting your instrument onto your phone, onto your iPad, getting a sound file on there, getting a, a video of yourself, getting comfortable with working with yourself in that medium, editing it, adding new video to it uh, is something I'm trying to push on the younger generation instead of just consuming the content, make the content uh, as well, because people really respond to it. Uh, it's fun to make little videos. It's gratifying when all the work, when you go to a TV studio, you know, when it takes off and a lot of people, you know, see it, it's pretty cool. So, uh, so I don't know. It's cool that I get to do that. Uh, I'm hoping you guys are figuring out how to get your, music though onto your own device how how you're working with that as well so please tell my flute listeners about your beatbox flute method books that are available for purchase and the services of teaching those techniques one-on-one -on -one. i have made so much content for people to learn and usually it's all locked uh, behind my patreon page uh, which is just patreon at greg patillo I think it's Gregory Patillo, actually. Um, but uh, I've put up like 300 videos. They are all of me talking about how to do the things that I'm up to. I'm frequently, I got the Sibelius worksheets. I love to do it. I love diagramming what I'm doing and what I'm talking about. I know how to print what I'm doing. I've made uh, uh, a method book. I just brought out a new little method book. The The Beginning method book is like 44 pages and it is comprehensive and it deals with um, these five sounds and how to do them with the flute and how to build vamps on the flute. And there's beatbox examples. There's how to do it with the flute examples. There are vamp examples. There are etudes to learn too. Uh, it's extreme, like I say, extremely comprehensive. And I got a new vamp book just with some ideas, with some uh, cool things that you can do uh, to figure out all the inhales of breathing on the beatbox flute. But these are available free if you join my Patreon, which is like five bucks or something. So you can get the 
book at wherever you get flute books. But um, really, if you're trying to hang with me or know more about my music, that's the place to be interacting with me or on Instagram. Uh, I'm on Instagram a lot, too. But uh, I've, I've made a, a bunch of stuff, and one of the tracks you're going to play later even is of the three beats, and that was a tune that was uh, commissioned by me, and I've been playing that a lot lately. Uh, and that is a tune that is on a lot of state standards for, like, solo state ensemble competitions. You can play that, and it's okay as a piece to play, uh, and it's cool. Man, people dig it. You can learn how to do this. Anyone can learn how to beatbox on the flute. Uh, you know, I learned by ear, but I know that a lot of my classical fluties out there, they learn by books. They want to see it written and they want to slowly take it in. So as much as I'm out there playing, I'm really big into education. I will happily show anybody anything I can do on the flute. I'm getting really good at articulating how I do what I do. I just need to know what you think is cool and we can talk about it. Um, but uh, I'm writing, I'm writing and I'm still writing. I got a bunch more ideas. I got the next beatbox method book with the more complicated sounds, lip rolls, uh, you know, BMG snares, these kind of things. They're, they're complicated beatbox moves, but they sound really cool on the flute. So hopefully that'll be coming out. And, and how about by, by Christmas. <laughs> a lofty goal. I doubt I'll meet that, but uh, I hope to. So for my listeners, uh, to let them know you've taught master classes on beatbox flute and improvisation at top music institutions that include Juilliard, Oberlin, and Berklee College of Music. I'm curious to find out how conservatory students that play classical flute repertoire, as yourself and myself, react to learning beatbox flute. Um, everyone is stoked. Everyone at first is apprehensive because they don't think they can do the skill. My favorite um, forum is teaching classical people how to jam. Wow. Okay. I, I love it um, because like classical people have, well, here's your word again. They have chops, all of them, but they don't know how to use them to jam. This blew me away when I first went to conservatory. I met these classical violinists that were playing these concertos with the sickest licks in it. And then I'd be like, oh, that's in D. Let's jam in D. And they didn't know how to use those licks and jam in them. And I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. If I could play that lick in that concerto, I'd be using it all the time, you know? And so, like, uh, uh, I love being with classical people. They all want to be able to – everybody wants to be able to just entertain and be cool on their instrument. And someone's like, oh, you play that instrument when you play something and to just pull it out and lightheartedly just play something. You know, some people have that memorized. Some people can just make up something and it's just cool, you know. And uh, that's what I love to teach. Let's just be creative on the instrument. Let's talk about how we can just like make music. And the thing is that people don't know their scales. Man, people don't know their scales. Maybe in jazz school, they know their scales, but classical people, they like maybe learn it to get good on their instrument uh, or fluidity on their instrument, but they don't know how like scales mean, you know, like a classical person, you can't sit down and have a two, five, one conversation, you know, like you're going to like lose them right quick. And if you start talking above the concept, everyone shuts down. So you have to use language and you have to use things that everyone can just do. And so um, uh, one of the first things I try to get people to do it when they're playing is to like sway when they're playing. All right. And so like uh, and in some ways, this is like a, a chamber music uh, aesthetic in a string quartet. There's no drum set, but there needs to be impeccable a uh, rhythm group rhythm there's moving bows everyone's breathing and everyone's really on top of the beat unlike other styles where there's a loud drummer and bass player you're maybe not going to be able to drive the rhythm of what's playing or the speed or the tempo because you're not loud enough that's not your job but in but but you can be like this okay in in string quartet playing music and so i like to get people to to sway to feel the music to feel a resolution to play over long tones here's a long tone everybody right now play a solo for us and think of your plan and your plan may be like, oh, my God, what am I about to do? I don't know. That's OK. Just acknowledge your plan. And we kind of build from there. What was your plan? Could anyone else tell that you were scared? And people are like, no, I thought you knew what you were doing. You see, see, you know, you just play whatever you want to. And it's situational and over long tones. And then we start doing long tones with a pulse. And we call those just simplified vamps. Here's a vamp. Can you play a vamp on a vamp? Can you play a solo over a vamp? Can you play 
a melody over a vamp, which is like a solo, but that's like maybe phrased longer over the, you know, what we're doing. And in this way, I can get a room of people that have no, and then we beatbox. Okay, now let's do our beatbox, you know, patterns over this. And then we can create new original music in the moment together. And this is the first time anyone there has ever done that. They have a great experience. And then I hope they try to do this with their friends at home. You know what I'm saying? So that's something that I bring into the table. It's like creativity on music 101. And I run this all over the country. I love to do I love to do it with young kids, like middle school kids, uh, high school kids, and definitely college and you know, adult amateurs too. I feel like if you don't learn how to improvise and then you get out of school, it's not like you can just walk down to your local orchestra and sit in on Monday. Like that's not how it works. Like if you then don't know how to just like pick up your instrument and make up music, you might not play your instrument much longer anymore once you get out of school. And I see this time and time and time again, people learn through school how to just play what's on the page instead of just being able to be entertaining on the instrument. So I try to bring that to the class and people are really receptive to that because let's face it, these master classes are so boring. Like you see the master dun, 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 with the famous piece and you heard him do it on the Poulenc so many times, but it's like, no, let's have a class and let's just jam. You know, I think a lot of people, when they start music, they think that's what it's going to be. We're just going to get our instruments and we're just going to make music. But it turns into something else along the way that's like graded and just looking at the ink on paper. Uh, and music is so much more. I mean, it's all about the ears and feeling it. So uh, that's what I'm trying to bring, man. That's what I'm trying to do with uh, with my beatbox. I feel like that's my calling even out there. And I'm happy to do it. Uh, and like I say, my favorite people are those classical people, man. They love it. You have a very unique trio outside of your solo career. Uh, uh, explain to my audience, if you would, um, you're the founding member of a group called the Project Trio. So it's yourself on flute, a uh, very fine saxophonist and bass player. And you're creating all of what you just said. You never lose time. You never lose enthusiasm. And it doesn't feel like something is missing. It's excellent. Thanks, man. Yeah, most of my work out there is with the trio, and we've been working since 2007. We've traveled the world. We made six albums, a ton of videos, and, um, you know, the whole concept is to cast a wide net, man, find a common thread. Like, no genre is off the table. We're a flute and a sax and a bass. Like, what is that? You know, so like we do classical crossover. We try to do jazz things that we think people will like. We try to do things from pop culture and just balance uh, what we can do with our instruments, the expectations of the audience, using tunes that they know. Like we do like a handful of Beatles tunes, but with like a different spin. People are really open to that, you know, playing along with ideas that they, they already know about. Uh, it's, man, we have a lot of fun on the road. I really get along with those guys. We all live here in Brooklyn. Um, we had uh, a, a different lineup for a long time. And uh, Daniel on sax, he's, he's kind of come on board over the past three years. And it's just a joy, man. We're, we're making new music. We got a whole new set we're brewing up. And uh, we have a lot of fun with it. Uh, and uh, I got to say, a lot of what we do, too, is educational, situational type stuff. Uh, in fact, tomorrow I'm going to spend the whole day working with a high school. We're going to do a bunch of classes and then we're going to do their springtime concert at night. We have a bunch of tunes that have been orchestrated. So we'll work with the band, the orchestra, the choir. We're going to play tunes with them. We hype them up, make them look cool, play part of the show. Uh, and that's some of our favorite work to be doing, uh, interacting with kids like that. So if you could pick two selections that you feel best represents what you do as a beatbox flutist that I could filter into this interview now as you speak about them. Okay, well, the first one is um, this tune, Hotel Craziness, which uh, recently was reposted on Instagram. Uh, and I got a lot of action on it. So it's like, and it's kind of like a meme. You might see it out there in many different forms. So this isn't one of my like original videos that blew up, but was something I, I was in Indiana at a flute makers and I was in my hotel room and we had like a half an hour until we did something. And so I'm picking this because like, this is some of my best work has come out this way. You have half an hour and you got a video camera, i.e. Uh, an iPhone. <laughs> like, 
let's make something. What are you going to make? I don't know. And you just like turn on the phone, come up with an idea and let it rip and you see if you can form it out right quick. And so this is what I did. I just like ripped out this like jam and threw it on the internet and like people love it. They think it's so it's great. My eyes are all bugging out. I'm really into it. Uh, and that I don't know why I called it hotel craziness. Uh, so that's it. Uh, you should check that out. It's a really hard hitting beatbox crazy flute jam. <laughs> So the second one is kind of hard to find, but is, I think, my best version of me playing my piece, The Three Beats for Beatbox Flute, which was a commissioned work by the National Flute Association in 2011. They wanted a piece for their high school um, competition for flutists where the flutists would beatbox on their flute knowing that the students didn't know how to do that and their teachers didn't know how to teach them. And so that was my challenge was to write a tune that was cool, accessible, relatively easy with the skill. And that's what I wrote. And um, that tune has had a great success. A lot of people have played it. A lot of people have programmed it on their recital. You can get the music. You can learn it. Like I said, it's just for high school age. Um, and um, this is uh, something I did at the World Flute Convention back in 2016. Uh, and it's from a video, and it's not labeled as the three beats. So I had to really sleuth to find it. Um, but uh, if you ever see the video, I, I have a sick mohawk. I'm pretty stoked about that. I can't really pull off the mohawk look anymore these days but uh uh it's a uh, it's good looking and it's a pretty good recording of me doing it and uh you should check it out um be inspired to uh play it yourself <laughs> So where can my listeners find you on social media and if you could share any upcoming live performances or projects you'd like to announce? Oh, um, man, I'm up to all sorts of weird things 
all over the place. I don't do any of the business for my trio, so I don't really keep up with that. I just look on my calendar and go where I'm supposed to go. But I am online. You should rap with me online. I would love to jam with you online or we'll follow you. Like, what's up? I'm trying to meet interesting musicians out there. Everything I do is kind of under Patillo style. My last name is spelled with two T's and two L's, Patillo. So Patillo style, I'm like at Patillo style on Instagram and uh, Facebook, all over the place. That's where you can find me and uh, on Patreon at Gregory Patillo. Um, but please be in touch. I'm excited to know more about what you guys are up to. And if you're trying to learn what I'm up to, up to, man, I'm happy to talk your ear off about it. Greg, uh, thanks so much for a great interview. Uh, I'm sure my listeners will agree that after listening to your stories and your techniques and giving a little demonstration here and there, I'm sure they're going to all agree that you certainly got chops. <laughs> Far out, man. Thanks. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, Greg, have a great day. It was a pleasure um, having you here on the show today. All the best. All right, man. Cheers. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for joining me on today's show. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and could hear why my guest got chops. You can follow my podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Anchor.fm, and stay connected between episodes on Instagram at Gotchops Podcast. Join me on the next episode when we discover why my next guest got chops. <laughs>